Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very, very, very special guest today. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Sor Sorghum United, and he is an amazing individual, and his name is Nate Bloom, and he's here today to talk about a lot of great things, and one of the things he's going to tap into today is challenge yourself to help you grow into the person you really want to become, to, to show yourself how you can rejuvenate yourself and really reach the goals that you have intended your entire life. And I'm going to give the plate to him because he has such amazing stuff. I'm going to shut up right now and let him do all the talking. So, Nate, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm honored to have you. You know, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Sure. And Stacey, uh, it's so nice to be here with you. And it's nice to meet you. I absolutely love what you're doing and talking about uh, about our mental health and about how we challenge ourselves and how we grow and become you know introspective leaders. Is, yeah. is really, really important. And we need more people like you that are doing this work. So thank you. I just really, I, I can't thank you enough for the work you're doing. We need, we need more leaders in this space. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So, um, well, yeah, so I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I grew up on a farm just a little bit west of where I live now. Um, but uh, I grew up in the 1980s and there was a farm crisis at the time. So even though we're fourth generation, my cousins, my cousins and I were all told, uh, go find something else to do. And mm -hmm. uh, that's a dangerous thing when you tell a young person uh, who's never really been off the farm, go find something to do. Because, uh, you know, as uh, Tolkien would say, uh, the road is a dangerous thing. If you don't uh, mind where you're going, then you never know where you might end up. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> so, through, so through that, I ended up uh, actually starting a family very young. I had my oldest daughter when I was 19 years old. Um, and so while every, all my friends were having uh, fun in their twenties, I was learning what it meant to be a dad and, yeah. and how to, uh, how to, you know, do better for my family. Right. So what that also meant was that I started a family before I went to college. Right. So, um, what I ended up doing, I worked for a couple of years, uh, without any higher education. And I just realized I couldn't get ahead doing that. And so yes. I ended up um, taking classes at the local community college and working at a hospital here in Lincoln. Uh, and so I take classes in the evening and then I would work at the hospital, uh, you know, during the day. And after a couple of years of that, I had gotten all the classes I could get out from the community college and decided I want to transfer to the university. Yeah. And so at that same time, I also transferred then to the emergency room in the hospital where I had been working in oncology before. And right. so that flip-flopped everything, right? Because the university yeah. doesn't have evening classes. Uh, so yeah. I actually went to class during the day, and then I worked overnights. And I did that for about three, four years. And that meant I slept for about three or four hours a day for three or four years. <laughs> so overall, I worked in the hospital for about 10 years um, wow. before, uh, before finally graduating. I graduated to full 10 years after I uh, graduated high school. But I yeah. think that was my first experience really with uh, challenging myself and recognizing that there was uh, not only opportunity for growth, but a need for growth. Yeah. And, and that mentality uh, really now has stuck with me um, ever since. And, you know, one thing that I find is um, I find that my most unhappy times almost are, are those times when I'm too settled, when I don't feel challenged. And it's really easy to slip into those times. We're just discontent with our lives and we don't really know why. Yeah. And so we sit down and realize that, hey, maybe, maybe I've got these golden handcuffs, right? Maybe like things are really, really comfortable, but I'm not really feeling challenged. Yeah. Uh, now, not everybody's like that. Some people love to to be there and that's great. I love those people. Uh, we need all kinds of people. I'm not saying that any one is better than the other. Yeah. But for me... Um, mm -hmm. you know, what I've found is I'm, I'm kind of addicted to information. I'm addicted to learning. Yeah. I read all the yeah. time. Um, I'm challenging myself all the time. And what I find is that, uh, you know, really when I get in a spot where things just aren't interesting anymore, um, boy, that's just, again, just the worst. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, anyway, so as, as through that, I guess I should say, um, after I graduated, I wanted to find something new. So here had been 10 years at the hospital, which by the way, I tend to average about five years in a position before I feel like it's time to move on yeah, uh, yeah. For, for better or worse. 
And uh, so I ended up actually getting a job immediately as a financial advisor, which is a crazy thing, right? Um, but you'll remember in 2009, we had a little stock market crash, a little economic yep. downturn. And yep. nobody was hiring, especially not for somebody with a degree in psychology, which is where my undergraduate is. Right. And so um, so I got a degree as a financial advisor and I worked that for a couple of years, but I just wasn't very happy. I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not a detail oriented guy necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but like everything else in my career, it led to the next thing. OK, and that next thing was um, I volunteered at the time with the Alzheimer's Association and. Um, as a part of a way to grow my network and build my financial practice. Uh, but it was also was something I was passionate about having a background in healthcare. Yeah. And they, they sent me to Washington, DC. Um, this would have been like 2010 or 11. Mm -hmm. um, they sent me to Washington, DC and I'd never been there before. They sent me for their annual conference and then a day on the Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, now the day on the Hill happened to be a Wednesday. And if you, uh, if you are from Nebraska, you probably already know this, but I, um, on Wednesday mornings, uh, something that happens when the Congress is, is in session is called the Nebraska Breakfast. It's the longest standing uh, continuous state breakfast uh, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and so that, means, that means at 8 a.m., uh, all the members of the Nebraska delegation, you know, three congressmen, two senators, uh, they come together with a room full of about 50 people usually, and they talk about what they're working on on the Hill. And what I realized, so I'd never been there before. Uh, the other members of my group had. Uh, so I ended up going to the breakfast by myself. And about halfway through, because I'm not a morning person, it takes me a little bit to get going. Um, yeah. But halfway through, I realized that the uh, co members of Congress, before they would speak, they were introducing people in the crowd. And then those people had, would stand up and they would speak for three or four minutes about why they're there. And so about halfway through, I realized, oh, my God, I'm here by myself. I'm going to have to speak. And I was mm -hmm. terrified of public speaking. Uh, so I got up and I just regurgitated all the stuff they told us in the conference, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And afterwards, one of the congressmen, uh, came up to me and says, man, you did a really great job. You really speak well, which I thought was crazy. Cause again, I really done any public speaking to that point. Yeah. And, uh, anyway, I ran into him a few times that day. And every time I saw him, he says, you know, boy, you really did well at the breakfast. Well, a couple of days later I stayed, did some sightseeing. And then I got on a plane to come home on a Friday and, uh, Nebraska is not a very big state, uh, and, and usually on Fridays is when the delegation will come home. And so I ended up on the same plane as this congressman. And he looked at me as I was walking past. Of course, he was in first class. I was in the tail section where they put the baggage. And uh, uh, he, he said, man, you did a great job. So a couple of months later, I'm, I'm there in my office doing this financial gig. And again, not a numbers guy, really pretty miserable um, yeah. and nothing against financial advisors. I love my financial advisor. Right. I just know that yeah. I'm, not, I'm not good at that. Right. Anyway, so, so I did the most um, naive thing, I think, in retrospect. Uh, but I wrote a letter to his office and I said, I'm not asking you for a job, but here's my resume. Here's my background. Um, you know, everybody in the district, right? If, yeah. if you could point me in the direction, maybe somebody who, who, who could use what I do, right. That'd right. be great. So again, I mean, who writes their congressman with that kind of a request? Help me find a job. That's the stupidest thing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, sure enough, a couple weeks later, uh, I was taking my daughter sledding, my youngest daughter. She was very small at the time. And, uh, my phone rings, unknown number. I answer it. Hey, this is the congressman. I remember you from the breakfast. I've got your letter and your resume here. I happen to have a position open up and I wonder if you might be interested in coming in and talking about it. Wow. And so from there, I mean, this guy hired me. I'd never worked politics. I'd never worked policy, but he liked how I was able to present myself. He liked that right. I could, um, he liked that I could think critically and that I could communicate all of right. them, which I think are very important things. Um, yes. Even though it scared the heck out of me, I said yes to him. And uh, talk about a time of incredible challenge. I mean, how invigorating that was to learn all these new things and challenging yeah. sometimes at times too, because you didn't always get it right. And in a yes. congressional office where you don't get it right, you will know about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that was fantastic. I did that for five years. Um, still friends with him. He's no longer in office. Uh, um, he was a tough guy to work for. Tough guy to work for. But, uh, you know, once you got through that kind of an environment, what I found is you can really do anything. Yeah. And, you know, but after about five years there again, I kind of felt like, 
I felt like I got everything that I could get out of out of it. And yeah. I, I found myself really in year four, about halfway through, pretty unhappy, a little depressed. And I couldn't figure out why, you know, because yeah. I had this great gig. And I, it's, I finally realized I just wasn't challenged. I was ready for something new. Right. So from there, um, I, I got a job actually as the executive director of the Nebraska Grain Sorghum Board. I wanted to be a little more involved in agriculture. I had retaken over our family farm at this point because my father had passed away. And, um, you know, so I want to be more involved. This position came open and I, and I took it right but here again. Uh, they had no business hiring me. I'd never been an executive director before. I am pretty sure that I only hired me because I was all they could afford. It's a yeah. smaller organization when we talk about agriculture organizations. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really know anything about sorghum at the time, or we say Milo here in North America. It's the most common right. name here. Um, but, uh, I knew that we used to grow it on my farm. And I knew that that area didn't grow it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all. Um, but then as I dug more into this crop, I realized that boy, from a health and nutrition standpoint, from a sustainability standpoint, a, a carbon sequestration standpoint, biodiversity, water conservation, soil conservation, yeah. from all these standpoints, uh, these grains, sorghum and other millets, yeah. uh, they really check a lot of boxes and they're very, very underrepresented. Um, and in my experience, the uh, existing industry is very happy with the status quo uh, for a lot of different reasons that maybe we will or maybe we won't get into. Um, right. And so what we were trying to do then at the Nebraska Sorghum Board was not only increase our acres uh, and, and provide opportunities for our farmers to diversify their cropping systems, yeah. um, which we did, by the way. We increased acres in Nebraska by 130% in four years. Wow. Uh, which, I mean, it's still small fish, but it was a big deal. Oh, um, but we're what we're also trying to do is change the system a little bit. And what I found is that systems, when you're talking systemic change, sometimes it's hard to do that within a system that doesn't want to change, right? Right, yeah. Um, and, and at the same time, we also uh, happened through our social media presence uh, to create kind of a accidental international brand uh, where I would go on trade missions and people weren't asking for U.S. sorghum. They were asking for Nebraska sorghum. Oh, uh, wow. and, and we ended up building partners uh, in other parts of the world too. And uh, so about two years into that, uh, we'd started this group that we now call Sorghum United. It started just as a loose group. We'd get together uh, on Zoom and to figure out what are some things we could work on together and still be competitors in other areas, that sort of a thing. Yeah. And then in 2022, uh, we found out that sorghum was going to be included in the International Year of Millets, which is every year the United Nations designates, uh, the United Nations body, the General Assembly, yeah. designates it to be a year of whatever. So year of legumes, year of tree nuts, year of, I think this year's the year of the cameloids. Okay. Uh, so in 2023, they had the International Year of Millets and sorghum uh, in June of 22 finally was included in that. Um, so we spent, you know, six months preparing for that. How can we leverage this? And assuming that everyone in the sorghum industry was doing the same thing. And yeah. so I made plans to go to the opening ceremony as did some of my, uh, cohort from Europe. Um, yeah. and so December of 2022, I was at that opening ceremony at the FAO and, uh, I looked around the room and I was the only person from North America there. And wow. the people from Europe, there were only a few of them. And most of the folks were from India or Africa, East Africa in particular. And so we said, gosh, you know, if nobody else, I mean, not national sorghum, not any other sorghum states, you know, whatever. If nobody else is going to push this, it's got to be us. And yeah. so we were in a position at that time that uh, financially, my family and I, uh, yeah. that I was able to, when I came home, I quit my job and we made Sorghum United a full-blown NGO. And that was 19 months ago. Now wow. you talk about talk about uh, finding ways to challenge yourself and continually wow. the, the need to continually reflect reflect and to grow. Well, you want to yeah. if you really want to do that, jump off the deep end and go start an international NGO. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's what uh, that's what we've been able to do. We started with a few hundred members. Now we've got uh, you know over three thousand. We have uh, <clears throat> our membership represents all points in the sorghum and millets value chain on yeah. every continent except for Antarctica. Uh, so wow. what that means is, you know, your researchers, your farmers, your seed dealers, input providers, 
value added processors, uh, logistics people, uh, investment bankers, uh, all the way down to consumers. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. It's been really challenging, but uh, even, and even in that I found yeah. uh, even just recently, actually, as a matter of fact, um, I've, I found that it can be kind of easy to kind of lose your way and, and you need to sit back every now and again and yeah. evaluate where you are. Um, you know, if something's out of balance, uh, work, family, whatever, you know, if, if something is out of balance, um, rather than pushing through, stepping back, um, taking that quiet time to reflect yeah. Being honest, being honest with yourself when you say, hey, you know what, this is a problem. I'm not going to make an excuse for myself as to why I'm yeah. doing this thing. Um, instead, I'm I'm going to hold myself accountable and I'm going right. to allow the people around me to hold me accountable and yeah. I'm going to make a change. And when you do that, things quickly come back into focus. They quickly come back together. But it's not always hard. I mean, it's not always easy, I should say. Uh, you know, there are right. some of these things we hold really close to us uh, as like kind of golden calves and we and we shouldn't. Right. Yeah. So, so that's a little bit about me. And that's, you know, I, I feel very strongly um, about keeping balance uh, in, yeah. in your life. And, and as a leader, uh, being introspective is really important. Always remember to point the thumb before you point the finger. A lot of people yeah. don't. A lot of people don't always understand in the moment why they're feeling the way they feel, whether that's happy, angry, depressed, whatever. Yeah. And when you do, when when you don't understand uh, why you're feeling the way you're feeling, that's when the emotions can take control, and that's when you make oh, yeah. mistakes. That's when uh -huh. you make mistakes. But if yeah. you can understand, if you're in the car and you're like, "Man, I'm really mad today. Why am I so mad?" And if you just yeah. take a second to take stock of, okay, well, why am I mad? Well, then right. you're not anymore because you understand okay great right this is this yeah. is why but it, it wasn't that big of a deal i should just let it go right, right. that's the kind of a thing and, and it helps you to become more intentional and uh it's it's very advantageous especially in business settings uh when you're sitting across the table from somebody because you can keep your calm and 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 really kind of stay a step ahead sometimes with somebody yeah. who's not uh, as in control of, of themselves yeah, that's great that you realize that because that's a lot that's very hard for a lot of people to do a lot of people sometimes react on their emotions and they don't they don't take a step back or maybe take a deep breath and and to really you know take it all in and, and just try to relax for a moment and then clear their mind and then focus on what the situation is why do i feel like this and how should i approach it in the most productive way and that for many people is very hard and it's not always an easy task to learn it, sometimes it takes time it takes practice it takes experience but it's something that you know if people were able to incorporate in their lives it would be you know a much more productive you know society where people especially in businesses or even at home you know could could work to communicate and to excel in all areas of their lives well, and I'd love to tell you that I'm absolutely perfect in that regard. But anybody who's ridden in the car, <laughs> anybody who's ridden in the car with me, uh, when people are driving ten miles under the speed limit or they're not using their blinkers or whatever, they will yeah. know that I have not mastered it in all facets of my life. <laughs> 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 That's the one when I'm behind the wheel. Uh, you know, it's not a road rage situation. For the record, you don't need to have it. <laughs> <laughs> but when you know, so I, I sometimes host people from other countries uh, when they come to Nebraska. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. some few times a year. Actually, we usually have house guests from all over the world, and I've taught some of them some new words in English that they didn't know <laughs> when they were in the car with me. <laughs> it's oh, a cultural experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I wanted to ask you, um, when it came to Sorghum United, um, where, you know, you, you, you've you done a lot in life and, you know, but you could see this is your true passion. You could see that this is really what you're, you're passionate about, what you want to do in your life, what you, you know, you put all your cookies in, in a basket in this area. It seems, you know, you know, how did you know that this is what you wanted to do when you, you know, you, you've been, you've 
practiced in so many different areas of life. You've been, you know, you've done government work, you've done a lot of different things, but when it came to Sor Sorghum United, when it came to agriculture, you have like a true passion and how, you know, for so many, for a lot of people, finding that true passion in life and really acting on it is very hard. People search their entire lives to figure out what, what makes them happy and what really, you know, do they want to focus on in life? How did you know that you were headed in the right direction? How did you know this was your passion? Well, I'd like to tell you that it was well-scripted and planned out, but uh, the reality is, and, and just as I shared with my career being as diverse, I mean, from the from healthcare to financial services to congressmen to then agriculture and now this, um, you know, it's it's almost it's always been uh, unplanned, unscripted. Uh, one door leads to the next door, sort of a thing. Right. Uh, the common theme, the common theme for all of it, uh, is the service aspect, and I've always, um, I don't necessarily like the term a servant's heart because I think it's kind of over you. yeah uh, mm -hmm. but but that's what makes me happy I've, i'm always at my happiest when i'm doing for other people so if you're i don't know if you're a love language person you know, i don't know if you ever read that book seven love languages uh yeah. you know my love language is do it okay mm -hmm. and and so that's just always what brings me joy and when it comes to sorghum united uh and even when i worked in the sorghum board i mean it wasn't just about agriculture i was yeah. serving for my members, uh, for my farmers in Nebraska. Then I was right. trying to give them new economic opportunities and more opportunities on their farms. And with Sorghum United, um, it's it's not even really about sorghum and millets. Um, yeah. What it's really about is about helping people. You know, mm -hmm. uh, about 2% of the world's population is directly involved in agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're usually poorer than the 98% of the population that they're feeding. Wow. And I don't think that that's right. You know, the average yeah. farmer outside of the U.S. and maybe parts of South America where we have large scale agriculture, um, the average farmer is two to three hectares, you know, maybe one hectare. And mm -hmm. that's not that's not very big. And so yeah. they end up being very, very poor. Uh, it, it partially because of the way our commodity marketing system works, right? And yeah. so- what I see for sorghum is the opportunity to to help farmers around the world by placing value addition opportunities proximate to the production of grains. Yeah. Um, and doing so allows for direct contracting, <clears throat> mm -hmm. excuse me, allows for direct contracting and more intentionality in which kinds of varieties of things we're planting, but yeah. it also allows for more opportunities for diversification within cropping systems. Um, mm -hmm. Because the commodity markets <clears throat> globally uh, really are reliant on only a handful of grains. And, and we like those grains too, right? If yeah. you've ever heard me talk, you've always heard me say that disclaimer. We like corn, rice, wheat, all that stuff, soybean. We like those, um, but they're, we're over-reliant on just a handful of these grains when the reality is that these other grains, sorghum and millets, which were among the first grains ever cultivated by mankind, uh, yeah. can check that box for on-farm diversification through local value addition, creating jobs in a community as well. And at the same time, they happen to be really, uh, really good for the environment, uh, good for carbon sequestration, uh, breaking the soil compaction layer, which then makes other crops more drought tolerant, yeah. uh, water conservation, uh, soil microbiome health. And they also happen to be really, really good uh, for human nutrition. And so it checks a lot of boxes. And so your question is, how how did I know this is the right thing that I want to do for the rest of my life? I like the opportunity to build things. Uh, that's mm -hmm. exciting to me. So we're building yeah. the, the ground up. So that's something. But really at the heart of it is, um, you know, that service piece. And do I want to do it my whole life? No, I'm, I like problem solving. You know, I'd, I'd love to build this organization to a position where it takes somebody with a uh, greater administrative talent than I have to run it. And then right. I'd like to move on to the next problem. Right. You know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. I mean, one thing I, I told you earlier, I, I wasn't a good financial advisor uh, because I'm not really super detail oriented. Um, and one thing I learned when I was the director of the Nebraska Sorghum Board is that in reality, I'm not a very good administrator. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the minutia. I don't like the paperwork. Um, I, I like to be in front of people. I like to speak. I like to look at big picture problems and then bring those people uh, that know the things I don't know, bring them in the room. Yes. 
you know, I think it's this is something uh, a lot of your listeners probably have already heard, me, uh, but I'll reiterate. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And right. what I tell people uh, when they say, wow, how, how do you know, you know, so much stuff, a high level, whatever. And I say, well, you know, that's the thing. I know a lot of it high level, but there's a lot I don't know. And the yeah. most important thing that I've learned as I've grown and challenged myself is that I don't have to know everything. Yeah. All I have to do is I have to know the people that know the things I don't know. That's right. It. So when I'm out, uh, I'm, I'm doing a field visit in Western Kenya, which I yeah. didn't worry, by the way. Um, and I'm talking with, uh, with farmers there and they're asking me agronomy questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, there's so much I can tell them, but then there's a lot I don't know because I'm not a trained agronomist, right? I mean, I know from right. experience. Um, so the questions that they ask me that I don't have answers to, I can connect them with that agronomist, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the same is true in any other thing, any other space. So just be honest with people and it's it's, it's okay to say, I don't know. Right. I think some people are, you know, their their self-esteem or their, you know, they, their self-worth gets in the way and they, they're afraid to admit, yeah, you know, hey, I don't, I don't, can't help you with that because that's not my expertise. And even though it's not, you know, people, people um, don't want to admit, you know, you can't, just like if you're a doctor, you know, and you have a certain problem, you know, a, a, one type of doctor, a primary doctor might, you know, send you out to a specialist because he only knows X amount of things. And you need to have a specialist it, that goes without any, anything in, one, in in the world. You know, you can only help people with what you know, you know, and then you have to, you know, you know, give them in the right direction where they can find someone that, you know, like you said, might know more than you than in one area, you know, and that can help them with that, with that specific topic. So I want to turn a notion on its head because a lot of people, I think when they think, uh, you know, they don't know, they see it actually as a limitation. I don't know. Yeah. That's my limitation. Mm -hmm. What I would tell you instead is when, because I used to be a person that was scared to death to say, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. But what I've learned actually is that it's really quite freeing because when you admit that you don't know something or you admit that you're not good at something, it helps mm -hmm. you then to move on to the things that you do know or that you are yeah. good. At, right. And that's actually incredibly freeing. So for a long time, um, working in like administrative type roles or you know doing paperwork at the federal level and all this stuff. You know, again, not being detail oriented and a terrible administrator of making mistakes there for a long time in my professional career, I thought there wasn't much I was good at. Right. right. And mm -hmm. what I didn't recognize was that the thing that I'm really, really good at, which is networking and connecting and seeing that 30,000 foot view rather than being, you know, down here at 10,000 foot view. Yeah. Something that maybe a lot of people actually can't do. They're not good at it. Right. So I'm judging myself by the things I'm not good at, and I'm failing to see that this is my place. This is actually what I am good at, right? Yeah. I didn't recognize that that organizational building was something that really had value. Yeah. And it's kind of like, um, I love quotes. You, you probably you talk to me any amount of time, you're going to hear quotes. And, and, and again, maybe it's been said before, but Einstein had a... Uh, uh, quote that's albert einstein not his friend uh cousin jim einstein but <laughs> but he had a quote he said if you if you always judge your fish by its ability to climb a tree you will forever think that you have a stupid fish <laughs> right so right maybe i can't climb the tree but man i can swim mm -hmm. you know yeah and so rather than limiting it's it is actually really freeing uh, but again you have to be honest with yourself and you have to be willing to say i'm not good at this Mm -hmm. and, and and I'm not good at this, by the way, is not an excuse not to do something, okay? Right. It's not an excuse because there are things that I'm not good at that I still have to do. But exactly. I've also learned, I've also learned that those things that I'm not good at, I might pass them through someone else that is good at it before I publish it, right? For mm -hmm. example. So keeping those people on your team is really important. Yeah, 100%. And I think, you know, one of the things you talked about that was very important because we started the conversation about talking about, you know, growth and, and being able to challenge yourself and reinvent yourself. I mean, making connections is so important. And sometimes I don't even think people realize how important it is in order to grow. You really need to make connections with the right people and develop friendships and develop, you know, business collaborations with other individuals and, you know, and partner and work together and to help each other. 
And, you know, for you, was it hard to to network and to make connections? Because I'm sure for people that have haven't done it in the beginning, it's probably scary for some and the fear of rejection might even take place. But, you know, um, once you start to make connections, you start to reach out to others, you know, uh, lots of wonderful things can come about that, you know. So what are your advice to, to listeners when it comes to wanting to build your business and, you know, you know, and making those connections? Well, I love fear. <laughs> it, sounds <weird. laughs> it sounds weird to say, uh, but I love fear because what fear is, is really our brains uh, telling us an area, recognizing for us, identifying for us an area in which um, we feel inadequate. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is that these are opportunities for growth. Yeah. So before I answer your question, let me give you a story. I told mm -hmm. you earlier when I went to uh, Washington the first time, I, I really hadn't done any public speaking. Okay. Right. So I recognized uh, after that that it scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> but I also recognized I couldn't get around it. I was going to have to speak public. And so what I started doing, uh, we went to a small church at the time. And what I started doing was once a month, I volunteered to read le the lecture, uh, you know, just one, one Sunday a month. Right. And so I'd get up there, congregation, maybe 100, 200 people. And for probably the first six months, I was so scared behind that podium, shaking it. You know, you probably, they probably thought Jesus himself was back there. A hand of God. <laughs> There's a holy roller in the Lutheran church. Uh, <laughs> but with any, like with anything, the more often you did it, the more you realize it was no big deal. And it's just practice. Yeah. Networking is the same way. When I was first asked, I, this was a, when I was a financial advisor, when I was first told to go to networking events, you'd go and you might talk to the one person you know the whole time. And yeah. then you, and what a waste of time. Or you'd stand in the corner and just hope nobody notices you, like, like you're yeah. at the seventh grade winter formal or something, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it's such a waste of time because that's not what you're there for. And what you realize eventually is you just continue to put yourself in that situation that scares you, that makes you feel inadequate. And what you realize is that everybody feels that way. Right. Everybody feels that way. And at the end of the day, and I travel, I literally travel all over the world now, by the way, speaking mm -hmm. sometimes to groups that don't even speak English, but I can still right. speak to them yes. um, through translators and things. But uh, what you realize is that people are just people. They feel the same way you do. They're probably just as nervous as you are. They probably want to get out there just as, as quickly as you do, but yeah. they also need the same things. Okay. And so once you realize that, and it's not so scary, yeah. Um, but you know, I, again, if something's scaring you. Uh, that's that's really an opportunity. So I like to flip things on their head, right? Yeah. It's never it's never this or that. There's always something in between, and yes. that something in between is where we find those opportunities. So you know, I I'll go back to it. I like fear, mm -hmm. I, you know, as long as it's not uh, you know some horror movie or something. Uh, yeah. You know, fear is a good thing. How would you tell people, you know, the people who are afraid to face their fears, you know, what is some advice that you could give them to overcome that fear and just do it? That's a difficult question to answer. And I could be very blunt and just say, well, you know, you just go out and you do it, which is yeah. how I approached it. Right. But people are different. And um, yeah. uh, I, I know people who are close to me that really suffer with anxiety and it's uh, yeah. it, it's a different thing for them. Yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. my advice is always take the bull by the horns, right? Right. Take the bull by the horns, immerse yourself and just go do it. Mm -hmm. But if somebody puts themselves in that kind of a situation where they literally can't breathe or having a panic attack, whatever, maybe that's not the right way for them. Right. Um, or maybe, maybe it is immersion, but maybe it's uh, smaller steps, right? Rather than big. Yeah. Leaps. Right. Uh, you know, so I guess that's the first thing I would say is, uh, if, if someone was asking my, my advice, how to do that is figure out at what increment you yeah. need exposure, right. And then expose yourself to it. Uh, and, and don't do more than you can. Um, here's another good example. Uh, so I grew up in a very, very small town, 450 people. I mean, I know apartment buildings that are bigger than that town, right? <laughs> and, um, I lived about well, 45 minutes away from where I live now. So what I found was when I got into high school and I could drive and do all these things, it was that being around big crowds really made me nervous. Yeah. And what I started doing was uh, at the time, this is the nineties. So malls were still a thing. Yeah. Uh, 
I would drive to Lincoln where I live now and I would go to the mall yeah. and just walk around because I felt so uncomfortable. I felt people were always looking at me. If I go in a store and I wasn't buying something, are they going to think I'm shoplifting and whatever, right? All these things. Everybody feels. Now I know that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and the first Saturday that I did that, uh, I think I made it a half an hour before I just had to get out there. Uh, and yeah. you can almost say, I remember it distinctly, you could almost say it was like having a panic attack, I guess. Right. I just I was very claustrophobic. I couldn't do it, whatever. And um, the next Saturday, it was 45 minutes. The next Saturday, it was an hour and a half, right? I mean, just yeah. continuing to immerse yourself and finding out and, and admitting that it's okay to stop when you've had enough, right? right. Because if you overdo it, then you're going to make the damage even worse. So you may, you're you not going to want to go back a second time. It's like starting to yeah. jog. If you if if you're a guy like me that needs to get back out on on the on the track and start some jogging, I'm probably not going to start with a six mile run because then I'm not going right. to want to do it the next day. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of that same thing. I mean, your brain is a muscle just like everything else. So why wouldn't we approach it in the same way we approach the development of other muscles? Right. A little bit right. at a time. A little bit of time. Love Find it. out where your pace is, and then right. go run the race, whatever the race is. I like that. I like that a lot. And every when it came to while, every once in a while, I say something meaningful. Uh, it's like a, the broken clocks, right? Twice a day. That's probably the only one you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other yeah. thing. Don't be afraid to have some self-deprecating humor. Right? It's. Uh, I think that's what gets you through it. Everything. You, you know, humor, uh, Stacy, is a wonderful thing. Humor is a wonderful thing. And uh, sometimes when I've uh, been in uh, high level meetings with other people, say a trade mission or something like that, uh, and if they haven't spent time around me, uh, they're a little put off initially in, in a high level meeting that I, I might make a joke at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. Um, and, and they say, oh, that's so unprofessional. But the reality is, it's it's a tool. This is humor. Mm -hmm. okay? Everybody likes to laugh when it's appropriate. Yeah. And what you find is when you go into a high level meeting and everybody's you know very buttoned up and you know very you know this is the protocol and blah blah blah. They we 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 go we come in there with these walls built up already, right? I dare yes. you to try to out outmaneuver me and get over my wall. Yes. The second you make a joke and you make someone laugh, those walls come down. Yeah. And so what I've found in, in using uh, humor as a tool in, in those high level situations is yeah. that instead of taking two or three meetings to get things done, we can get it done in the first meeting. Right. Because you've gotten, you've automatically taken the defenses out of it. You've let, especially when it's self-deprecated. Uh, to, yeah. to I mean, not so much that you make yourself look like a fool, but uh, to a degree, because then they get it. They're like, okay, this guy's just like me. You know, it's fine. And then you can be more candid. It's it's just yeah. it's a thing. So use use humor. Don't be afraid. Just you're in the C-suite. You're in the boardroom. You're meeting with a head of state, which I've done several times. Right. They're just people. They're just people. Make a little joke. Clear the air. And then get down to the meat of it. Get it right. done. Nobody wants a second or third meeting. They want to get it done. Oh, 100%. 100%. Definitely. Now, how did you feel about reinventing yourself? You talked about reinventing yourself. For a lot of people, you know, they, they come to a point in life where they, they need a change, but they don't know what it is. And, but they're afraid also at the same time, or they're impatient. You know, there are a lot of people who think that change occurs one, two, three, and, you know, it takes time to, re to reinvent yourself. It takes time to reestablish yourself in a, in a new area of business or, or life, you know, that you may, you know, um, decide you know, what's your ideas uh, of productively reinventing yourself? And, you know, when you come to that point in life where you really feel like, you know, there's more out there, this is not exactly where I want to be. That's a really good question. And, you know, the, the first thing I would tell you, and I'm not going to sugarcoat this, <clears throat> it's hard. It's hard. It's really hard to reinvent yourself, especially if you failed. Because uh, sometimes, and I've had plenty of times in my life where I've failed, personally, professionally, whatever. Um yeah. It's, it's tough uh, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is uh, usually when you when you find yourself in a moment of reinvention, it's usually a moment where you're pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. People don't tend to reinvent themselves when they're high on the hog, right? When they're at no. their peak. Because things true. are working. Why would you fix it? 
Right. Uh, but, but when it's broken, that's when the real opportunity for that is. And and yeah. you know, here's here's why I think comfort is the absolute enemy of progress, by the way. Right. Uh, because when we're comfortable, we don't want to change. Uh, but yes. that means we also don't progress. And when you're uncomfortable, uh, it's not a pleasant feeling. It's hard. Um, you know, sometimes it costs you relationships, whatever. Yeah. You know, you're screwed up. Maybe it costs you a job. Right. Um, and you feel pretty crummy. But it, you can either sit there and feel crummy or you can just, again, be honest with yourself and say, okay, well, why did this happen? Why did this person walk out of my life? Why did... Uh, why did this company let me go or whatever? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and you use that opportunity to fix it, which is yeah. the most productive thing you can do. I, a friend of mine uh, here in town, um, he runs what's called the Engler entrepreneurial uh, program at the university of Nebraska. They teach young people to start businesses and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and he tells his students uh, it's okay to fail, fail right. hard. He says, fail hard, fail fast, get up, try again. Okay. Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to is uh, being, uh, you got to be okay to fail. The other thing that makes reinvention difficult is that you have to remember the people around you, they may not be reinventing themselves. They may not be as eager to change and grow as you are. Yeah. Now, a, a fundamental um, philosophy that I've had, uh, a couple that I've had my entire life, and I'm, it's going to sound naive, but I, I don't care because I believe it. And yeah, uh, I think the primary thing that I can do on this earth is try to leave it better than I found it. Yeah, uh, which exactly. I think is if, if that guides your principles in whatever you do. I don't care if you make bubble gum for a living. You know, if you want to make the best bubble gum that's ever bubbled, uh, great, good for you. Okay. Yeah. In in doing so, I also think that for uh for our legacy's sake for posterity's sake I, I think that we owe it to our families to do better than than we had growing up so my my family was fantastic my mom and my dad they were great uh but you know we were pretty poor i was the first person in my family to go to college mm -hmm. um which is probably why i started a family first <laughs> <'cause I didn't... laughs> um and so I've always thought, okay, well, it's my job to do better than my parents. And and I've raised my kids, three of which are grown and out of the house now. Uh, I, I've raised them to do better than me. And they have. And they are, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but not all of my friends have done that. And there yeah. are a number of people over the years, not that I don't like them anymore. Okay. Um, but oh. you can't you can't always climb a ladder with somebody who's not willing to climb. Yeah. You know, I, and so if if you, if you, how do I say this? This is because th this is actually really close to home recently. Cause I had a friend of mine, we were friends for 25 years. Uh, so ever since high school and I was at their place for a, for a function not too long ago. And one of their family members was asking me about what I do. And I was talking about these international trips and meeting with heads of state and whatever. And we have an office in Mumbai now, and I'm opening one in Nairobi and, and their eyes just glaze over. And I, that's the kind of the moment you realize they can no longer relate to you. Yeah. But if you want them to continue to relate to you. It means you have to stay at their level because they're not willing to climb. Yeah. So you have to make a choice. I mean, it's not that right. you don't like them, but you can't, it's not the same relationship. So yeah. One thing I think when you're talking to your, uh, your listeners about growth, I think growth is absolutely important, but you have to know there's a, it's a double-edged sword. And yeah. there are times where, not to be blunt, but you have to cut the wheat from the chaff yeah, uh, in order to continue to grow. But it's okay because you'll find new peers, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and those mm -hmm. are the people you want to be spending time with anyway. You right. want to be spending time with people that make you better, not people that drag you down. And it might yeah. not be that they're negatively trying to drag you down or they're intentionally trying to drag you down. But yeah. You can't be something you're not. And if you've learned and you've grown and you've changed, which I think we should always be doing, then you can't be that same person either because yeah. you have to be the same person wherever you go. Right. And so it's it's tough. It, th that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing. But I wouldn't change it. I mean, I wouldn't change it. Are they he, my, That guy, he's got a great life. I love him. Great family. Mm -hmm. But he's not someone I can talk to about about the work that I'm trying to do. And I get right. it, but there are people all over the world now that are part of that conversation that I do consider to be peers that yes. maybe 
years ago, I they wouldn't have given me the time of day because I wasn't at that level yet. Right. I think that's a great answer too, because I think a lot of people go through that. You know, there are people who are in your lives for, for years, sometimes decades. And, you know, but then like you said, you know, you're climbing up the ladder and, and they're fine, you know, being where they are. And, you know, it gets to a point when you start to have conversations, you guys aren't on the same level anymore and it's kind of awkward, you know? So and then a lot of people are like, so what do you do? Because sometimes if you, you're around that person, you can, you have to limit yourself to their level. And sometimes it, it, you don't want to because you're not, you're kind of outgrown that, you know, but you don't want to be, be mean or you don't want to, you know, push that person away. So you have to kind of make a choice, you know, maybe limit your conversations or talk about something that you both have something in common, but you might not be as close, you know, or you might not be have, you know, as much to talk about anymore. But, you know, you have to sometimes do make a choice. And sometimes it is better to have people in your life that are either above you or achievers like you. So you could bring each other up and you can kind of climb up the ladder together and your your relationships will be more. Um, let's see, what's a good word? It, it will be more fulfilling, you know, also. You know, I've decided I never want to be on the other end of that conversation, by the way. I don't want to be the person whose eyes glaze over because you told me something. Yeah. Uh, and here's where I learned this is a kind of a fun little uh, story. And I, I, I got to honor his memory. So I'm going to share this if you don't mind. Uh, no, go ahead. Several years ago, I met an older gentleman. Uh, his name was Grayson Robinson. And uh, Grayson uh, wasn't his real name, by the way, but that's how what everybody knew him from. And I remember the first time I talked with Grayson, he was telling me all this stuff he had done in his life. He worked on the early rocket program with Werner, under Werner von Braun. Uh, he helped start the POW MIA program here in the U S wow. uh, he all, he, uh, you know, helped bring, uh, uh, a certain kind of hogs to Nebraska, uh, yeah. at personal request of Jimmy Dean. And you're talking to this guy and he was a guy that you, you, you just couldn't tell if he was being serious or not, or if he was just BSing you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I knew this guy for several years and some of the stuff I knew was true. Like I knew he helped start the POW MIA program. His brother served in Vietnam and was lost there. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I knew that. But you just some of the stuff he told you, like the Jimmy Dean thing or working under Werner von Braun. And yeah. what the, like this guy's all over the place. He's just pulling my leg. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, eventually, as I mentioned, he was older and a couple of years ago, he, he passed away. And I went to his funeral. I made it a point to go to his funeral. And you know what I learned was that it was all true. It oh, was really? all true and more. He owned a part, he owned a casino in South Dakota. He did, you know, had all these other businesses. He really? uh, this, that he did was larger than life. And you know what? After spending some time with him, I realized I want to be him. Mm -hmm. I want to be that guy that when I start talking about the things that I'm doing, the things that I've done, the places I've been. I want people to think that I am absolutely full of garbage <laughs> until, they, until they go to my funeral and say, oh, wait a minute. It was all right. It was all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about whether or not your eyes glaze over. I, that's not going to limit what I'm doing. I yeah. only get a chance at this life, right? We all only yes. get one chance. I'm going to go mm -hmm. out and I'm going to do every damn thing I want to do. I'm not going to do things I don't want to do unless I have to do them. Exactly. I'm not going to waste my time staring at a clock. I'm not going to ever work for anybody else again. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go and I'm going to do the things that I do because I recognize that my ideas have merit, yeah. that I can make a difference, that I am making a difference. And while I might make mistakes, I will learn from them and I will move on. The sun will come up tomorrow. It is not the end of the world. Yeah. I love it. I love it. That is awesome. Now, let, let me tell you something else I, I, I did uh, just a year ago for the first time ever. That's actually been a big, big learning curve. Um, at Sorghum United, uh, you know, I mentioned what we do in our, as far as a mission yeah. goes, but, uh, you know, we're a self-funded organization. And that means, or for the first time, I had to become kind of an entrepreneur where I've been in service roles so far. And, uh, Sorry, I got totally distracted because stupid WhatsApp. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so I had to become kind of an entrepreneur. 
and because we're self-funded we don't take taxpayer money and we're right. uh we, we don't go after grants we want to be completely independent being a a true international organization uh, this is person by the way it's calling is from kenya <laughs> and she doesn't understand i'm not talking right now uh, <laughs> So what we did was we we said, hey, we need to find uh, ways to not only um, generate revenue, but if we can wrap that up in, in part of our mission uh, as far as markets development, let's do that. So yeah. what we did, we published a series of children's books. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see this. Okay. There we go. Can you see that? Yes. So we published a series of children's books called The Sorgo Squad. And what these are is they're, they're comic book style books. I describe them as Indiana Jones meets Captain Planet. Um, they, they're, they're purposeful. Uh, they're intended for kids between the ages of nine and 13. Uh, we've mm -hmm. gotten great reviews uh, from classrooms, uh, home schools and things like that. And uh, this is where we generate our, our general revenue from right now. Uh, we have some other things in the works. Um by the way, I am currently looking for a new literary agent. Uh, the one we had previously uh, was not great. Um, mm. Website here is sorgosquad.com. If you want to support the work that we're doing at Sorgum United, this right now is the best way to do it. Um, but they're also a lot of fun. I mean, we again, kids love them. We get great reviews. But you talk about doing things that you don't know how to do. I've never yeah. published a book before. I'd never written a book before. I love to write. I write a lot. I certainly yeah. never a children's book. Um, usually what I'm writing are academic and white papers, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so this is new, but it's scary. Uh, you don't always know um, if what you're doing is right. Okay. Right. But you, you just got to take the plunge and just do it. Uh, recognize you're not always going to be right. Recognize you're going to make mistakes um, mm -hmm. and then go after it, fix it, whatever it is. Right. And, and this has been sometimes kind of a high tuition, so to speak, meaning that some some mistakes you have when you're trying to get started in the industry can be kind of expensive. Uh, yeah. But in, in general, it's uh, it's better to have done it and, and made those mistakes than to uh, not do it at all. Exactly. And and that maybe is one thing, too, that I would tell people if we're having this kind of a conversation with uh, with a younger person or even a younger me. Um, was that it's better to do something and to have done it wrong um, and made a mistake than to have not done anything at all. Uh, right. So often I think we get kind of this paralysis because we just don't think we can. Yeah. Uh, and the reality is sometimes it's fake it till you make it. Uh, yeah. But if you're going to make it, you do, got to do the fake it part first, right? Right. So, exactly. But yeah, sorgosquad.com, again, um, you know, uh, looking for a new literary agent for one, but for two, you can buy those books on Amazon or on our website. Uh, and uh, you know, they're good. Kids, kids really like them. We've gotten good reviews. So do something yeah. new. It's okay, it's fine. Now, if you had to take our conversation and you wanted to sum it up, what are some some things you'd like to emphasize to the listeners from our conversation today? Well, uh, based on our conversation, now I, I should. Uh, talk about sorghum and tell you more about it and all these other things. And I'm always glad to do that. I can always come back and do it. But you can also go to our website, uh, sorghumunited.com, or you can find videos on YouTube of me talking ad nauseum uh, mm -hmm. about sorghum. Uh, in fact, there's a presentation I've been giving over the last year, year and a half, um, called the, the Role of Sorghum and Millets in uh, Reshaping Global Food Paradigms. Mm -hmm. um, I was also recently on the BBC uh, uh, while I was in Rome, I've, I've been appointed to a private sector advisory committee at the FAO and the BBC interviewed me. Uh, so that video is available. There's tons of stuff on our YouTube all, all over the place. You can find it. But from our conversation today uh, and, and given the audience that you have, uh, what I would say to sum this up is I would tell people really don't be discouraged. So if you're listening to our talk today and you're like, wow, this guy's 43 years old and look at everything he's done and he's grown a global organization and he's been all over the world, which by the, I'm pushing like 35 countries now, I think. Um, don't compare yourself with other people. Yeah. I don't care if you're 63 years old and you've never been outside of your own state. Right. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where you've been. Yeah. So much as what matters is where you're going. Right. So if you've got trauma in your life or you've always been, you know, a person who's been afraid to take that next step and, and afraid of growth, 
that doesn't limit you from doing it tomorrow. Right. That's that's how I would sum up our conversation. I would say, take those things that make you afraid and maybe you've never done anything about them. Maybe mm -hmm. you've always let that fear limit what you do. Take it by the horns and, and do it tomorrow. Right. Don't be, don't be afraid of it. What's the worst that's going to happen? I mean, I, unless you're afraid of skydiving and your parachute doesn't open, that's different. <laughs> I don't know a single situation uh, in, in which skydiving is a marketable skill. So mm -hmm. that one's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe stuntman. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but be encouraged. Recognize that you're not defined by the things that you aren't good at. Mm -hmm. but what you are good at right and go find those things don't waste your time on things you're not good at just find the people that are good at things you're not good at doing and put them right. on your team it's okay to be challenged it's okay for people to tell you your idea is not very good because sometimes it's not right you know i just hired uh i just hired and announced it this morning as a matter of fact uh for the first time we now have uh three new regional directors and uh, a new communications director and what I told these people in particular was that I didn't want employees. Mm -hmm. I want team members. I've got a lot right. of ideas. I've got a lot of ideas and some of them are great. Some of them really aren't. And I mm -hmm. don't ever want to be that emperor with no clothes. I want people that can challenge me in a respectful way. Yes. And I, and I want to be able to challenge them without them getting upset and stomping out of the room. Right. You know, so I don't know. To sum up our conversation, I think I think that's where I'd I'd put it. I'd say just believe in yourself. Just just do it. And if you fail, get up, try again. It's not the mm -hmm. end of the world. The only failure is when you stop trying. Quite frankly, right. Uh, you know, so just just go for it. I like that. I like that a lot. Now you you went over the series. Tell us a little about you know, um, Sorghum United, and tell us about some of the services that you provide. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, Sorghum United, uh, I mentioned again, Sorghum Squad is one of our uh, things. We really, what we focus on is that markets development piece uh, and education. Mm -hmm. so that's where Sorghum Squad fits in. Um, mm -hmm. I would say consumers can't request a product if they don't know it exists. And most right. people have no idea what sorghum and millets are because mm -hmm. the grains are marginalized for so long. But the other thing that we do in Sorghum United, the real value we, we provide to our industry uh, stakeholders is really connection and aggregation. Mm -hmm. We're a grassroots organization. There, uh, there are now a couple of other uh, sorghum organizations operating at a larger international level, mm -hmm. but they're really they're really academia only, right? Which okay. academia is great, but you know we we want to be with the people. I want to be able to go do those farm visits in India or uh, in Sudan or wherever, right? Wherever it's yeah. safe, to, I should say. Right. Um, I want to be able to go do that. I want to understand really what the problems are say around small scale mechanization or around yeah. entrepreneurial uh, education or, or what what are the things that need to be uh, fixed and how then can we fix them uh, to this point we don't really produce a lot of content we tend to aggregate content and reshare it yeah. um, there are entities within the industry that i would consider maybe to be a competitor right. um, or maybe antithetical to what we're trying to do uh, not mm -hmm. always helpful because again, the industry likes to stay where it's at sometimes. Yeah. Um, but credit where credit's due when, when they've got good materials, we're happy to share them and give them the credit for it because it's important, I think, uh, and, and not to let our ego get involved. Um, you know, that's, that's really what we do. The why, the why we do it again, sorghum we know is extremely nutritious. Uh, we have now well over 200 peer reviewed uh, research papers from around the world that show that sorghum helps to rebalance human gut microbiome. It helps to reduce inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel effects, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it has anti carcinogenic benefits, uh, usually tied to tannins or polyphenols. Mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, it, it has um, anti diabetic and, and weight management benefits because it's lower on the glycemic index. Right. Um, some of this research has even been done in human populations. Uh, the problem is that we've large; it's largely been forgotten. And yeah. while we do like those other grains, the corn, the wheat, the rice, etc., um, the reason we advocate for these grains is because nobody really else is in in the yeah. way that in the way that we're doing. 
Yeah. Uh, so it's really important, uh, important work in that sense. Uh, these grains were among the first that were ever cultivated by mankind, by the way. Uh, right. Our ancestors grew these in places like Mesopotamia and Africa. And so what I like to tell people wherever I am in the world, uh, that this is actually something we have in common. These are heritage grains is what I call them, because no matter where you're from, we all came from Africa originally. Yes. Uh, you know, that's that's what we know scientifically. And mm -hmm. so that means that our ancestors all were eating these grains. Right. What, hap what happened over time was, and I call this kind of a post-colonial hangover, uh, mm -hmm. when European powers went into places like Africa and Asia and they saw these grains, they didn't know what they were. And right. they didn't know how to use them. And so what they told people was, uh, you know, these are poor man's grains. Uh, these, we're going to lump them all in a category called millets, which, by the way, I say millets don't exist because there are actually a dozen different varieties of millets. Sorghum, right. being, sorghum being considered a major millet. Um, and then they told the people to plant corn. And a lot of these people did, and some still are. Um, but others are now going back to sorghum and millets because with climate change in particular, uh, yeah corn doesn't always make sense right uh, you know i was just again in february i was in west pakot kenya i was doing farm visits very very rural very traditional tribal communities you know you get out of the out of the van or whatever and uh you know these people come out they dance you into the village sometimes wearing clothes sometimes not uh, yeah speaking english and, you know one village in particular that i visited um they are they are reliant and have been for a generation on food aid on USAID on grain being shipped in. Why? Because uh, a few generations ago they switched from millets. It's a very dry area, very dry. Area. Okay. And basically, you consider a desert. Mm -hmm. And they switched from millets to maize. And when the maize failed, their livestock failed. And now all of a sudden they're not independent. They're de they're dependent upon mm -hmm. outside food. Um, but this generation now has learned that they can grow sorghum in that environment because it's drought, yes. it's drought tolerant and uses very little water. Right. Now that community, that community is now on its way to relearning how to be independent. They're breaking a multi-generational cycle of learned helplessness by changing their cropping systems. And while my friends here in Nebraska that uh, maybe are on a trade mission selling corn would be really upset because that means we might sell less corn there. Yeah. I say that's good. It's good yeah. for the, the economy there. It's good for the people there. We think about, by the way, we think about political systems and security. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in this country, one of the things that's certainly in a campaign year, top of mind is, uh, you know, the migration of people over the southern border. This is a really good example about how food systems and security tie in together and why what we're doing is important. A lot of countries where uh, people are, are coming from in Latin America are mm -hmm. countries also that are dependent upon uh, shipments of U.S. grain. When a country becomes so dependent upon shipments of out grain coming in from outside, it can displace the agricultural opportunities within that country. So I'm not, right. I'm, I'm going to be very careful here. I'm not anti-trade and I'm not diminishing the opportunity for international trade and what that means for our farmers. We need those markets. Right. However, over-reliance on outside grain diminishes the agricultural opportunities in those countries. When right. those opportunities are diminished, that means that people don't have economic opportunities. Okay. Think about uh, the exodus, uh, the migration, even in the in middle America from yeah. small towns into large towns. Why did that happen? Why did I move from a town that had 450 people uh, into Lincoln, Nebraska? Well, right. because it doesn't take as many people to farm anymore, right? Because we can do yeah. more with less, larger equipment. Yes. When that happens, there are less jobs in the community because you know, it's only maybe one or two members of the family that's doing the farming. Maybe yeah. the wife wants to go start a bakery, right? Or run the restaurant or, you know, the the cousin wants to go run the general store, whatever it might be, okay? Those opportunities right. aren't there anymore. And so people move into the large cities. It's no different in Latin America. Why do people come here? Part of it's crime, part of it's political asylum, I get it. But a big part of it is also because there just isn't the economic opportunities any, there anymore because the agriculture has gone in favor of large bulk trade. Right. And so- what we're really trying to do at Sorghum United, um, whether it's in Africa, Latin America, in fact, I'm going to be in South America here a week from now. I'll be in Peru. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And then after that, I'll be in Brazil uh, doing some speaking and, and doing some site inspections and visits and things. Uh, what yeah. we're really trying to do is do that regional value addition so that um, not only can the farmers get a better price, mitigate their commodity marketing risk through direct contracting, yes. but so that we can also create uh, economic opportunities, which then provide the conditions in which political and societal stability can take place. So right. what we're doing through the lens of sorghum and millets is actually mm -hmm. much, much bigger. So I joke that all we're trying to do is solve all the world's problems. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. And so tell everybody again, your website, where they can find you and they can find all this information. Yeah. So sorghumunited.com. That's S-O-R-G-H-U-M united.com. The books are at sorgosquad.com. That's S-O-R-G-H-O squad.com. We're also all over social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, we have a, WhatsApp, a global WhatsApp group. If someone wants to join that, there's a link at the top of our website for that. Um, I think we're on, I think we're on TikTok. I don't know. I don't use it. Um, you know, uh, all, all, all the, pla all the platforms we're on all the dot coms, whatever. Um, so, so find us, follow us. If you want to know what's going on, um, you know, that's probably the best way to do it. You might get tired of seeing this all the time. We're trying to fix that. We're working on it. Uh, but uh, I think what we do is pretty cool stuff. Uh, even if you're not in agriculture and most of, frankly, most of our stakeholders are not in agriculture. They're in adjacent yeah. industries. Um, but everybody eats. Yes. Yeah. Hundred percent. Now the the Sagram United is that um, is that mostly for um, are, are you are they sell, are selling products or is it an organization where all area, all areas of people can kind of bond and and learn from each other? Like, what's the primary purpose so people understand clearly? Yeah. Well, Sorghum United, the website is primarily for information and kind of helping people understand what we are and who we are. We are very different from, I think, any other organization within our space. Yeah. Um, I, I talk to a lot of NGOs. I talk to a lot of agricultural groups, et cetera. Um, a lot of them just simply don't get us because what we're doing is so different. And right. I don't, I don't mind that. I don't, I don't mind being the guy sticking his head up from the trench. Right. It's, it's yeah. fine. And, and there are times where we take bullets and, and that's part of the gig, right? That's part yeah. of being a leader. Yeah. Um, if people really want to interact with other people, uh, mm -hmm. the best place to do that is our global forum is on our WhatsApp group. Now um, I say that uh, most of our members are actually on LinkedIn. There's only a couple hundred, maybe 250 on uh, the WhatsApp group, but uh, it's really interesting because we have a lot of folks from uh, Africa and India. We're getting a lot of people, we're getting more people from Europe and South America now. Um, and when, when people are sharing what they're doing within the space, whether they're processing, whether they're farming or they have a question and somebody else is answering right. it, it's really, really cool to see this free exchange of ideas that transcends political and geo, uh, geological uh, uh, boundaries, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's really, really cool. One good example uh, I like to share is uh, we have a member who is a very, very respected researcher from Iran, of all places. Now, you might know if you've had your head out from under a rock any time in the last 50 years that yeah. Iran not necessarily friendly uh to the u.s and right. i will tell you this this guy <laughs> privately i don't want to get him in trouble i'm not going to say his name but i know he doesn't have a lot of respect for his regime uh, yeah. but and through this group he's able to share his research with those countries which would otherwise be boycotting him simply because of where he's from right and what i what i love about our group in that instance or in any number of instances is because we're not tied to any one state and we try to stay yeah. neutral in all these things um, that regardless of how your country might feel about the other country, you yeah. can still at a personal level on a one-to-one -one or a professional level, you can still have these conversations, you can still contribute. And there are things that people can learn from you and you can learn from them. Yeah. You know, so it's really a, an amazing thing uh, when when you get to sit back and just watch it. Wow, that does sound amazing. 
this has been this is this has been truly an amazing conversation. It really has. Uh, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, you know, you've been a whirlwind of information today. Um, you shared a lot of different things, and they all pertain to everybody's life in in in, in any shape and form. You know, um, so you know, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. I hope you'll be on the show, you know, again, and we can talk more, you know, about all these different things that you're doing, and you know, and help people understand how. They can even further improve their lives. And in that, you know, there's always hope. There's always hope. If you have faith, courage, wisdom, strength, and hope, you can go anywhere in life. And you've you proved that in your conversation today. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And before we go, is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, I would just thank you, Stacy. And and that was a very, very kind thing of you to say. That's an, another good way to say that is that I talk too much. Uh yeah. so- <laughs> this has really been an enjoyable conversation you're very good at what you do uh it's been I, I love these organic conversations they're not scripted and uh just kind of that you know again people are people just getting to know each other and that's that's fantastic you always have an invitation to nebraska so long as i'm here uh, <laughs> works, so you know, give me a heads up first um <laughs> take you to a husker football game and uh you'll 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 enjoy it um sounds great it's such a pleasure. And again, thank you for what you're doing. This, the space that you're working in is so, so needed. I think mental health is um, really foundational to a lot of uh, our societal problems, yeah. uh, whether it's in the U S or other places. And unfortunately it often gets overlooked. Yeah. Um, I say it gets <laughs> overlooked because it's, it's always kind of a, a red mark on the ledger, right? It's never yeah. mental health services, exactly. are never revenue generating really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we really can't afford to continue to look at it that way. Right. And so what you're doing in a way represents systemic change as well. I appreciate and, that. And I respect that quite a bit. Thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And I, I look forward to, you know, having you on the show again. Thank you so much, Nate. This has been wonderful. Anytime, Stacy. Thank you. You have a great day. You too.